CircuitPython programmers, newbie electronics makers, and lovers of LED lights and robotics. I'm Professor John Gallagher, and in this lesson, we're going to discuss some of the more important issues to consider when choosing a board to run CircuitPython. Now, I won't look at the hundreds of boards that are available, but I will cover a subset of boards that I hope you find interesting, and I'm going to mention some of the more important issues for newbies to consider. I'll also highlight some of the gotchas and common mistakes that are easy for beginners to overlook, including a few mistakes I've made myself, so let's learn big! Now do know that the boards that I'm highlighting here all support CircuitPython. CircuitPython and MicroPython are not the same. CircuitPython is based on MicroPython, so it's a derivative of MicroPython. CircuitPython is very powerful, but it's also designed with some features to make it easier to use. Now although CircuitPython is open source, it's backed by the company Adafruit, and it's very well supported. You'll find hundreds of learn guides and sample projects on the Adafruit Learn site, and online you'll also find lots more material by unaffiliated folks like me. Now in my university class, we build robotics projects, accessibility projects, we work with the Internet of Things, and I haven't found anything that I've wanted to do that CircuitPython couldn't do. Now the Adafruit community on Discord and the Adafruit forums is world class. I usually get an answer to a question within minutes, so for those reasons, you'll see me emphasize CircuitPython. If you want to know more about the differences between CircuitPython and MicroPython, there's a lot written online, but I think CircuitPython is the best place to start, and I haven't needed to switch. In my Physical Computing University course, I don't teach using the Arduino programming language. That's a derivative of the C programming language. Arduino coding is not as beginner-friendly as Python. You can run Arduino programs that execute much faster than Python, but since Python is the most popular introductory programming language, CircuitPython can be a really good first choice for working with microcontrollers. Now, the term Arduino refers to both the Arduino company as well as the C language-based Arduino programming language, but the Arduino firm has also announced increased support for MicroPython. You can already run CircuitPython and Mic MicroPython on many of the more powerful Arduino boards, although not on the base Arduino Uno. Expect to see even more Python support on Arduino platforms in the future. Now, Python is currently the most popular programming language. Most computer science programs use Python as the first programming language they introduce to students. Python is used in all sorts of applications, including data analytics. In fact, all of the undergraduates at the business school where I teach have to learn the Python programming language. Now, if you've been following the CircuitPython school videos, you know that we started with the Circuit Playground Bluefruit, or CPB. And this was a great first board because it's loaded with features, and in our learning videos, we worked with built-in LED lights, buttons, capacitive touchpads, the light sensor, the accelerometer, we connected the board to potentiometers, servos, external light strips, and in the Bluefruit school videos, we learned how to control the board via Bluetooth and use a free app for control and color selection. So hopefully, you feel that we've learned a lot. Now, the CPB was also a great beginner and educational board because the pins and pinout holes that are available on most microcontrollers are available in the CPB as these larger pads that allow us to easily make connections using alligator clips. Now, in my physical computing course, after students have used the Circuit Playground Bluefruit, they're migrating to the Raspberry Pi Pico W. Now, at the time that I'm recording this, this board is available for about $6 in the United States. The W on the board's name stands for wireless. You get Wi-Fi capability for only $2 more, so I think it's a good investment. If you get the Pico without the W, you'll have no Wi-Fi. The Pico W has a big silver square on top. That's the Wi-Fi chip. The base Pico has a Raspberry Pi silkscreen logo where the Wi-Fi chip would have been. Now this board will apparently eventually support Bluetooth as well, although at the time that I'm recording this, that hasn't been implemented yet. Now there are a few options when purchasing the Pico W. If you're learning, you most likely want a version with header pins. That's going to allow you to use a breadboard. That's this thing here. It's for connecting wires, which can be used to connect other components to your board. Now earlier purchases have had to solder header pins on themselves. Even though a version with header pins pre-soldered is listed on most websites, at the time that I'm recording this video, I haven't seen that available anywhere. Now that will change, but if you can't find a version with header pins pre -soldered, soldered, buy the version with loose header pins that fit the board, and you can likely ask someone at your local makerspace or school to solder the pins on for you. It should just take a couple of minutes. Now, because the Pico W has Wi-Fi on board, we can use it for IoT or Internet of Things projects that communicate over the Internet. Now, any CircuitPython boards that support Wi-Fi also allow you to do things like a gather data on weather, sports scores, stock and crypto prices. Now, my students use the Pico W's Wi-Fi features to send commands from a website that lets them control a Pico W-based robot that they'll build. Now, in addition to accepting commands, internet-connected boards can also report data over Wi-Fi. So, for example, you could use a magnetic switch to send a message whenever a door has been opened, or you can use a soil sensor to have a plant send a tweet or other message whenever it needs watering. Pretty cool. 
Now, at a very basic level, one of the most practical things in being able to access the internet in a board is that you can more accurately report and update the time. Now, while we've seen with CircuitPython on the CPB, we can count off seconds like we did with the time sleep function, but most boards don't have a built-in fully functional clock. But if you can access time over the internet, you can easily add clock features to your program. My students access time over the internet when building a small box that lights up when it's time to take medications, a super useful project. Now, a few reasons why you might not want to consider this board. At the time I'm recording this, there are no versions for purchase with headers pre-soldered. Expect that to change. Now, apparently this board is capable of supporting Bluetooth, but it hasn't been implemented at the time that I'm recording this, but expect that to change as well. But even when Bluetooth is available on the board, it might not be supported by the Adafruit Bluefruit app that we used on the CPB. So if that's important for you, the current version of this board might not be the right choice. Now, Bluetooth is nice for wireless projects that don't need the internet. Say, if you wanted to use an app to change colors of a wearable that you might use where you don't have access to Wi-Fi. Now, there's also no Stemma QT port on this board. I'll describe what that is in a minute, but there are add-ons for this, a four-wire add-on for the breadboard, or you can buy a low-cost expansion board called a Cowbell and solder headers on that board. That board has a Stemma QT port. And while I have had success powering portable Pico W projects using a small mobile phone charger, there isn't any pass-through battery charging on this board. I'll describe that in a bit as well. Now these next boards are the ultra-tiny Adafruit Cutie Pie boards. Adafruit calls them QT boards because they have a built-in Stemma QT port, and Pi because of CircuitPython. You'll find similar boards called Xiao by the Seed Studio Company, that's Seed with three E's. And there are two main reasons to buy one of these boards. First is size, they're among the smallest boards you'll find, and second, they have the built-in Stemma QT port. Now do be aware that there are several versions of the Cutie Pie board and each one has a different feature set. So this one here is called the Cutie Pie RP2040. It has the RP2040 chip on it, the same one that you'll find on the Pico, but it doesn't support Wi-Fi, so it's the equivalent of the Pico and not the Pico W. Now this purple board here is the Cutie Pie ESP32-S3, and getting all of those letters and numbers correct is important because there are similarly named versions that don't have the same mix of features. Now the Cutie Pie ESP32 S3 is very nice because it does support Wi-Fi. It even supports Bluetooth. So the code that you write for the Pico W should run on this board too, with very minor, if any, changes. Now there are reasons that you might want to skip a Cutie Pie board, and those include most boards don't ship with pre-soldered headers, so if you don't have a soldering iron or don't want to solder, this might not be a board for you. No pass-through charging. Also, if you need more pins for more wiring, smaller boards mean fewer connection pins. Not a big deal if you're using Stemma QT, but Cutie Pies won't be a good board choice if your project requires a lot of wiring. Now these boards also don't provide the kind of expansion that we're going to see in feather boards using the feather wing standard that I'll show in just a minute, but Cutie Pie boards do have their own expansion modules called BFFs. Now BFFs plug into the board on top or on the bottom, they'll increase the thickness of the build. BFFs typically do require some soldering, but if you browse online you'll find BFF add-ons that do a bunch of things including adding pass-through charging to a Cutie Pie board, adding a micro SD card for more memory, adding a press button for internet of Things projects, or easily connecting three wires to a NeoPixel strip or strand. There are new BFFs rolling out all the time. Now the next category of boards that I'm showing are boards that have Feather in their name. Now all Feather boards are the same width and height, and they're nearly but not quite the size of the Raspberry Pi Pico boards. Now this is a standard format for microcontrollers. Feather size boards are really popular. There are a lot of Feather boards, and they more or less use the same standards for pins and connections. Now the Feather format has been out for a while, so there are a lot of Feather boards available. This is the Feather RP2040. It's about the same as the Pico board, but it has passed through battery charging and a Stemma QT port. This board does not support Wi-Fi, but if you search online, you will find boards that support Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, Feathers that are designed to support lots of LED lights, feathers with built-in displays, lots of options are available. Adafruit has a great site with more information about feather boards, and also note that not all feathers run CircuitPython, so you want to be sure to verify that the board's going to run your programming language before you purchase it. Now another big advantage of using feather boards is that the standard size and pin connection for these boards means that there are a lot of add-on boards that just plug into the feathers and offer all sorts of additional features. These plug-in add-on boards are called feather wings. Now there are all sorts of feather wings that provide additional capabilities like running motors that you might use in robotics projects, or adding different sensors, there are wings that include built-in displays, there are ones that add Wi-Fi or Bluetooth capabilities, so you can search online to find examples of dozens of feather wings, just double check with your vendor to make sure that the wing will work with the type of feather that you're using. Now we mentioned one potential plus for some of these boards is that they come with a built-in Stemma QT port. 
and it's worth taking a little bit of time to talk about STEM AQT because this is a really useful standard, but there are a few things about it that can be confusing. Now this is a really easy to use connection scheme that will allow you to simply plug in devices to the board using the standard connection cable. Now in these videos and in my class, we're going to be using STEM AQT to add things like a temperature sensor, a 12 pad capacitive touch sensor, and a gesture and proximity sensor. Sometimes you'll hear add-on boards like this referred to as breakout boards. Now, STEM AQT devices use a communication standard called I squared C, written as the letter I, the number two, and the letter C. Now, most microcontroller boards support I squared C. That's just a communication standard between boards and add-on devices. But if you don't have a STEM AQT port like this, then to use I squared C, you have to hook up four separate wires for power, ground, data, and clock. If you've got a STEM AQT port, you can plug in any STEM AQT breakout boards with this one connector that brings together all four wires. And not only can you plug in the devices with this cable, you can also daisy chain devices together so they can all share that one port. Now, STEM AQT is Adafruit's name for this standard. SparkFun calls the standard QUIC, that's Q-W-I-I-C. The I-I-C stands for I squared C. And SparkFun's QUIC standard only supports 3.3 volt devices. The Adafruit STEM AQT standard is a little more flexible. It supports 5 volt as well as 3.3 volts. Now, if you want to use a QUIC breakout board from the SparkFun company and you want to use CircuitPython, just make sure that there's a CircuitPython library to support that device. Also, even though the STEMA QT connector is really handy, it uses the I squared C communication standard and not all the things that we want to attach to our board use I squared C. For example, if you want to hook up some hardware that we used in our previous lessons, like the NeoPixel light strips and strands, or the servos and potentiometers that we'd used in our CPB lessons, these don't use I squared C, so they don't link directly to the STEMA QT port. A dead giveaway is that these devices used three wires, while the I squared C standard that STEMA QT uses uses four wires. Now in most cases, you'll hook up three wire devices like this NeoPixel strip using a breadboard. Here I'm using a breadboard with a Raspberry Pi Pico W. Now the breadboard is this plastic rectangle that you see here with the pinholes in it. You insert header pins into these holes to connect up wires so that you don't have to solder. Also note that even though the Pico W doesn't have a STEMA QT port, we're going to connect one to the board using a four pin wire connection that has a STEMA QT port on the other end. I'll show you how to do this in a future video. Now, one other thing that's easy to confuse, there's another standard, actually two standards called STEMA, not STEMA QT. There's no QT at the end. And this system is not plug compatible with STEMA QT. And it gets even more confusing because the STEMA standard has two different kinds of connectors, a four pin and a three pin standard. Now, here's what you need to remember. The four pin STEMA standard is compatible with STEMA QT because both of these standards support I squared C. You can use the STEMA 4 pin with STEMA QT if you have a special adapter cable. And there's also a 3 pin STEMA that's not I squared C devices, so it doesn't work with STEMA QT. Now, if this is confusing, just make sure that you buy breakout boards that are specifically STEMA QT with a QT at the end if you want them to work with the standard STEMA QT port and the standard STEMA QT wiring. I've made the mistake of buying devices that were just STEMA devices and not STEMA QT devices, and they didn't work with a port and wiring I wanted to use them with. Now for portable projects, you might also care about having a board with a JST battery jack that also supports pass-through charging. That's this jack here that you can see on the Feather RP2040. This is the standard jack that's used for hooking devices up to rechargeable LiPo batteries, and even better, this jack provides pass-through charging, so if you plug the board in over USB, any LiPo battery that's plugged in will automatically recharge. Now pass-through charging is convenient because it means that you don't need to buy a separate battery charging board. It's also nice because you can often plug a battery into your project, never worry about disconnecting it. And this is an advantage because JST connectors are sometimes tough to unplug, and it's really easy to accidentally break off these wires. Now, if you do use LiPo batteries, they're chemically flammable and they can be dangerous if they're punctured. So you should definitely do some research online before working with them but they're very popular and they can be a good choice if you know the risks and you're careful. When choosing a board, another lesson that I've learned the hard way, make sure that you check the type of USB port that the board uses. More boards are shifting to the newer USB-C style ports, so you might need a new cable with these boards. The CPB and the Raspberry Pi Pico and Pico W boards use older micro USB style ports. Also, always make sure that you're using a data cable and not a charge only cable. If you use a charge only cable, your device won't show up on your computer. Now, all the boards that I've showed you up until this point are microcontrollers. That means that they run one program at a time, and they aren't running an operating system. Now, the Raspberry Pi Pico and Pico W are microcontrollers, but when most folks think of Raspberry Pi, they think of the firm's general-purpose computers. 
These are usually numbered Raspberry Pi Zero, Pi 3, Pi 4, and these boards have a Linux-based operating system. You can install multiple programs on these devices, they can even run a Windows-like desktop, and they can run multiple programs at the same time. Now, Raspberry Pi boards are more difficult to set up, they have additional advantages, including lots more storage. That's great if you want projects that require storing large files, like audio files. These boards usually have more expansion ports and capabilities. Some old-timers claim that these single-board computers are real computers and microcontrollers like the Pico aren't. Microcontrollers run programs, they compute, I call them computers. The main difference is that even though Pi single board computers are tougher to set up, they're a bit more flexible, expandable, they can act as desktop computers. Microcontrollers are great for special purpose projects, for creating smart hardware projects, and these are sometimes referred to as embedded systems projects. Now also know that a Raspberry Pi can run CircuitPython. All we need to do is add an additional software layer called Blinka. There are videos on how to do this on my site. Check out that set of tutorials if you're working with the Pi computers. Now for newbies and educators, I had used the Raspberry Pi 3A Plus boards in my course, but I switched to using Raspberry Pico W microcontrollers. For robotics and IoT projects, it simply took too long to set up things on the Pi boards. Our students spent several hours getting the Pis set up, getting them to work on our unconventional campus Wi-Fi network, adding audio support, getting CircuitPython installed, adding the ability to copy files over the internet, and adding some additional internet of things software. There were a lot of things that could trip up students, and I found this led to more frustration. It ate up a lot of class time and led to less learning. Raspberry Pis are great computers. A lot of educators use them. They can be an especially good choice if you want to incorporate a camera or do any image recognition, but they really weren't the best choice for everything I wanted to accomplish in a single semester. Now that said, you can still find lots of tutorials for the Raspberry Pi computers on my YouTube channel. Now, if you've been following the channel for a while, you might have noticed that in earlier classes I used the Arduino Nano RP2040 Connect board as well. Now, this is a great little board, but at the time I'm making this recording, the Arduino RP2040 board sells for about 25 bucks. It has a few sensors built into the board, but once the Pico W board came out and it was only around $6, our class switched to the cheaper Pico board. Now also when buying boards, pay attention to whether or not the header pins are on the boards. Now sometimes there are no headers on the board, other times the header pins are included but you have to solder them on yourself, other times the boards can be purchased with the header pins already soldered on them. And you likely want the header pins installed on your board if you're going to be using the board for learning and you're going to be using a breadboard. Now why wouldn't you want headers installed? Well, if you wanted to keep the device flat, so you usually use a board without headers if you're creating a final project. You can solder the wire directly to the pin holes instead of having to work with the pins. It is possible to desolder header pins if you've already got them soldered to your board, but it's actually pretty tough to desolder header pins after the fact. It's not really something that a new student wants to do, or even a seasoned maker for that matter. So pay attention to see if headers are included with the board that you're ordering. I actually didn't pay attention to this, and I initially ordered 70 Arduino Nano RP2040 Connects that did not have the headers, and I did want the headers, so I had to send back all of those boards and exchange them for boards that did have the headers. So that's it for a quick comparison of the issues that I think are most relevant for my students. Students. There's a lot more to the differences between these boards, but hopefully you thought this was a good intro and you're armed to be able to explore more information online if you need to. Have you got a favorite CircuitPython board or additional advice for newbies? Leave it in the comments below. Just don't be snarky. Nobody needs that. Now in the next video, I'm going to show you how you can install CircuitPython on these various boards, use the REPL to show what pins are available, how to refer to these connection pins in our code, and how to look up additional board information online so that we can begin to understand how to connect devices to these boards. Keep at it!